Um, we're going to have a little uh, uh, chat today with, uh, with Jim Fish from Waste Management. And I'm going to read some bios, so bear with me, please. Oh, my name is Ben Harvey. I'm e. Har from E.L. Harvey and Sons, and I chair the Board of Trustees for the National Waste and Recycling Association. I'm going to introduce Daryl K. Smith, Dr. Daryl K. Smith. Daryl is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Waste and Recycling Association. Since 2002, Daryl has been active in the public policy arena in Washington, D.C. Previous to his current position, he represented the mining, petroleum, and chemical industries. Daryl has a reputation of assisting heavy industry in promotion of a positive, progressive image. Darrell received a Bachelor of Science degree from the Citadel in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and a Master of Public Health degree in environment, so, Environmental Science from the University of South Carolina. He also possesses a doctorate in Environmental Science and Policy from the George Mason University, where his research interests involve the resolution of environmental conflict between indigenous populations and the mining industry. Darrell's dis dissertation is listed as noteworthy by the Taos Institute. Prior to his public policy career, Darrell worked in the environmental and safety compliance fields for a number of industries, including hazardous wastes, telecommunications, and electronics. He is a certified industrial hygienist the, uh, by the American Board of Industrial Hygiene. Darrell resides in Washington, D.C., and Darrell has been our president and CEO for just about eight months. So welcome, Darrell. And uh, Jim Fish, Jr. is the President and Chief Executive Officer of, the waste, of waste Management. He is also a member of the Board of Directors. Prior to becoming CFO in 2012 and his promotion to President in, in July 2016, he held several key positions with the company, including Senior Vice President for the company's Eastern Group areas, Air, I'm sorry, Area Vice President for Pennsylvania and West Virginia, Market Area General Manager for Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and he is a Patriots fan for those of you that aren't, I'll just throw that in there, because I am too. <laughs> We were just talking about that. Vice President of Price Management and Director of Financial Planning and Analysis. He joined Waste Management in 2001. Before joining Waste Management, Jim held finance and revenue management positions at Westex, a yellow roadway subsidiary, Transworld Airlines, and America West Airlines. He began his professional career at KPMG Pete Marwick. <laughs> Fish earned a, Jim earned a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Arizona State University and an MBA in Finance from the University of Chicago. He is also a certified public accountant. Please welcome uh, Daryl and Jim Fish to the stage, please. I also want to bring your attention to this young lady over here that's going to be doing this little artwork. This is a fantastic thing to watch her write down. I, we did this last year, and my little sideline here. We did this last year, and and to watch her take the thoughts that are presented here today and put them on that board is fantastic. Cheers. Yeah. Comfortable. Our mics on. Very good. I feel like I'm sitting in a recliner. How you doing, Jim? Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, this is uh, like like uh, Ben said. I've been eight months to the industry, and I'm slapped up here on stage with the the king of the whole industry. So it's very, <laughs> very intimidated. I'm intimidated by your hair alone. So <laughs> I've been I've been saving that one. <laughs> Y'all laughed a little too hard at that, by the way. <laughs> I think Trevathan says the same. Yeah. <laughs> well. You know, I, I uh, have been here eight months, and I, I come from the mining industry most recently, over a decade in the mining industry. And uh, the mining industry, um, you know, knows a little bit about safety. And, uh, you know, Jim, we had a tradition there that uh, any time we started talking in public, or even if we started, you know, talking with a small team, we always started with safety. Would you mind, uh, uh, you know, starting that tradition here? Is that something uh, Waste Absolutely. Management already does? Yeah. We Actually, we do it at every meeting, yeah. uh, Waste Management. We have a safety briefing. It's short, but what we say, first first off, for those of you, here's, here's uh, we have multiple exits here, but in the event of an emergency, we should all uh, head out to the escalator here, head down, and then take a left and head out to a, uh, a point outside um, and, and watch for emergency vehicles uh, as they approach. 
And then anybody in the room that could uh, volunteer to dial 911 in the event of an emergency, somebody raise a hand. Thank you. And Jermaine. Anybody know CPR in the room? And Jermaine. Okay. We won't give the same person the same responsibility to this man here. So. So thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And that's, you know, any, anyone in a position of leadership in the industry should try to adopt that because it shows how much we care about safety and it, you know, it reinforces it all the time and it's just a good, good practice. Jim, would you like to correct Ben's statement about your Patriots, uh, Patriots <laughs> well, uh, loyalty? <laughs> I, yeah, so I, I am a Dallas Cowboys fan and born and raised, uh, well, grew up in Austin, Texas, yeah. so that was the only TV, uh, the only team on TV, but... Yeah. This year for the Super Bowl, as a Cowboys fan, I could not root for the Eagles. I'm sorry for the Eagles fans in the room, but I couldn't root for the Eagles. So I was a big Patriots fan during the Super Bowl. And we lived in, in Massachusetts, and we liked the Patriots when we were up there. Yeah, I read, I read an article about you where you were uh, you know, leader of this huge industry, but, but watching the Cowboys game stresses you out too much, and so you can't do it. I, I, can't watch, I can't watch their games. All, all my uh, friends at work think I'm a wimp, but I, I have to DVR them. And then check the score, and if yeah. they won, then I'll watch yeah. it. It's kind of low stress. <laughs> <laughs> if they if they lost, I just delete. I mean, it's easy. You got, you got to find some other uh, non stressful activity yeah. there. So. Um, you know, Jim. Before we get started on the good stuff like uh, China and other things, um, you know, can you you know tell everybody? Everybody's very curious about you. Can you talk about your family a little bit? Or sure. Like uh, I have a wife, Tracy. We've been married for 19 years. Two daughters, Nicole and Stephanie. They are. Uh, 13 and 15, so they're not they're not crazy about mom right now. So they they are crazy about dad, and I end up yeah. um, uh, being the one that they run to all the time. But we we've lived in we've kind of lived everywhere, but um, uh, really a, a great family. And and what I always say about my priorities in life, uh, they are faith, family, and job. And I always say job's a distant third, and it's not because yeah. my job's not important; it's because the first two are that much more important. That's excellent. So speaking of family, you know, Jim, we're the, the, the fifth most dangerous occupation, as, as everybody knows. And how, you know, what, what can we do better to uh, make sure everybody goes home to their family at night? You know, I, th I think part of it has to be a consistent message in, with respect to safety, a consistency in, in terms of how we treat safety. I think we've all, we all talk a lot about safety. We all say it's the, it has to be the culturally the top thing that we do. I, by the way, I would tell you that safety is not, not an initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, safety is not uh, something that we, we take on this year as, as one of our objectives. Safety has to be ingrained in your culture. I mean, um, yesterday I was asked about, uh, you know, about strategy, and, and safety is not a strategy either. Um, you don't hear ExxonMobil stand up and talk about safety. Yeah. They, don't, they don't talk about safety at a strategy meeting, they talk about safety as just being something they do every single day, and and so and ExxonMobil is regarded as one of the safest companies in the world, and, and so they, it's part of their culture. And I would tell you, as an industry, when we think about safety, there's a seat available up front. She's uh, <laughs> waving you up front. Um, I, when we we've all traveled around the United States, uh, Canada, traveled around the world, and and it's interesting. I, I'm always appalled when I see an, another company doing something that I believe, and, and I'm not saying that waste management doesn't have any of that going on either, but, but um, if I ever see a waste management truck uh, zigzagging, for example, I, in fact, I was in my neighborhood not too long ago and saw a, uh, a truck, not a waste management truck, but another truck that was zigzagging, which is, in, in my mind, terribly dangerous. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of, you know, I, I, we see a lot of unsafe activity taking place and maybe it's, it's our responsibility to say something. Now, you may get somebody that says, you know, who are you? And, and, and you know, get out of my face. But, but honestly, how, how many of you have seen uh, people standing in the hopper while they're cycling the hopper? I mean, I saw that probably a year ago when there's a, a traditional rear loader and they're cycling the hopper and the guy is actually standing on, on top of the trash in the back of the hopper while another guy is cycling. And I mean, I, and I was stunned. And I actually said to the guy, why don't you tell that? It's making me nervous watching that guy stand back there. Can you tell him to just get out of the back of the truck? Mm -hmm. And and the guy didn't say anything. He just looked at me like I was nuts. But I, but I do think as an industry, there has to be a, a, a consistency that there isn't today. There's you know we just honored a bunch of drivers and and um, uh, operators today, and they're all as safe as you can get. But you question whether all of their peers believe the same, mm -hmm. uh, have the same belief that they do. 
All right. And this, you know, it's not all us. You know, we have some uh, very safe drivers and very safe companies, and, uh, you know, we are fighting, um, you know, a war against distracted driving as, as well. So, uh, um, you know, we as a trade association are looking for things we can do. You know, Washington, D.C. is a good place to partner with other organizations, and we're trying to very actively find organizations that are fighting distracted driving. Um, we're going to be talking to people on the Hill about distracted driving, and that's going to be one of our big areas because, as everybody knows, you know, we can be as safe as we want, but we're out there with the public. Yeah. So. I, I would love to see. Last year we were up in, in Vancouver, and they have uh, anybody in the room from Vancouver? So this gentleman may be able to correct me, but but our driver told me that there there is a there are cops in Vancouver that actually give you a ticket if you're texting and driving. Is that true? Yeah, and and that doesn't happen in the United States. And and how often do you drive down the road in your personal vehicle and see somebody texting? And it, it, it to me it happens every day, and, and it drives me crazy. And I make an absolute point of telling our daughters and and, and my wife who used to text while she was sitting at a stop sign. Say, well, I'm not or at a stoplight. I'm not going anywhere. And I said, Tracy, you're sending the wrong message to our girls. Um, I, I don't think that we have drivers out there. We may, but 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 it's not about our drivers texting and driving. It's about the the general public. And I'd love to see cities adopt what Vancouver has adopted, which is a it's a it's a stiff penalty. I think it's it's five hundred to a thousand dollars. Is that? Three sixty. Oh. It sounds like maybe you got one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, and he, and he's, but he's only paid it once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, pulled, he came up with that a little too quick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Honolulu, I think it was that passed a law that you can't walk through a walk in a crosswalk while, while looking at your phone. And that's a good one too, because we have a lot of people not paying attention while they're walking. Um, you know, I was on a, a podcast the other day, Jim, and you know, since we're among friends here, I'll tell you about this awkward question that was asked to me that, that caught me off guard. I was, I was sitting there, you know, I always like to talk about safety first, and I was talking about we're the fifth most dangerous occupation, and then the conversation led into one of your, your favorite subjects, Jim, is trying to att attract new talent, um, and uh, you know, whether it be millennials or women and the like to, uh, to the, to the uh, industry. And the, the DJ asked, well, you know, you just said you're the fifth most dangerous occupation. You know, how are you going to attract people um, to the industry? And I think that's a question we all need to be ready to, to answer. And, um, you, know, what are you, you know, you can talk about you know, attracting new talent to the industry, but uh, you know, just letting you know about that, that question that came up for me that I had difficulty answering. So. You know, I, I think there's a couple of, of answers to that question. First and foremost, when we just talk about drivers and and those trade positions, I think there is a challenge in our industry. There's a challenge in, in, in a number of industries uh, attracting those types of jobs. Uh, you know, there's a question as to whether millennials want to drive a truck or want to work on, a, right. on uh, right. uh, you know, want to be a mechanic on a, on a truck, not just a, a trash truck, but any type of truck. Seemed, uh, you know, the, the, the going thought is that millennials want to all work for Facebook and, and, and Google. And, and, and look, I don't believe that's the case. Yeah. By the way, there's a generation that my two daughters are in that's not the millennial generation that's following that generation. So how do we make ourselves, how do we make these jobs attractive to, uh, to those generations? My father's generation, you know, my dad was, was uh, the son of, of um, you know, parents who lived through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So when he got a job, that was a job that he hung on to and it didn't matter. Um, and, and I think as I, as I look back on, on his generation, Leadership was not as, as uh, emphasized because there was almost a, 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 a for, it was a foregone conclusion that your employees would stay with you because they all realized that if I leave this job, I may not find another because my parents lived through the Great Depression. I think today's millennials, I don't think they're really any different than, than the baby boomers or, or you know, my, my father's generation other than they've never lived through a Great Depression, right. or they've, their parents didn't live through the Great Depression. And, and so, and their options, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. are, are numerous. Um, that means in my mind that we have to become better leaders of people. I'm not sure that that's in my father's generation. I think about my dad himself. I mean, he was a, he was a tough dad, he was a tough boss. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I would have wanted to work for my dad. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Um, well, you didn't know. <laughs> Yours are not. Okay, but uh, uh, but look, I think our parents' generation was was tough. I think in today's generation, doesn't mean you you shouldn't be tough, right. but we should focus on things in terms of becoming attractive, not just at at the driver level. I think we we should focus on how do we become attractive at the managerial level. Um, 
I would tell you my father's generation, there was no such word as diversity. Mm -hmm. And, and honestly, I could argue that when I came to Waste Management, there was no such word as diversity. <laughs> right. um, we've, we've, we've focused on it a lot, but focusing on it and actually doing something about it, I think are two different things. I mean, saying, yeah, look, diversity is one of our core tenants, and, and we're, gonna, we're really going to make sure that diversity is, is part of what we do. And yet, when I look at the makeup of our drivers, it's 40% it's 40, 40 Hispanic, it's 20% African American. Mm -hmm. And so uh, minorities make up the the majority of our driver ranks, and yet, do they make up the majority of our, our management ranks? Mm -hmm. Not even close, yeah. not even close. And, and to me, it's, it's a little bit insulting. I, you know, um, I think part of what makes us attractive is focusing on people who have different experiences, who are, who are raised in, in different settings. And that's, in my mind, what diversity does. It's, yeah. you know, I, 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 was, I may have been raised in a different setting than Tara Hemmer, who's our new Senior Vice President of, of um, Operations. Uh, or, um, or uh, you know, Jason Roberts, who's who's somebody we've identified, and, and African American, who really has we think a lot of runway in front of him. Part of the reason that Jason's valuable to waste management is a because he is representative of that sixty percent that make up the majority of of the of the driver ranks, and b he may have grown up with different experiences than me, and so there, therefore he may have different different insights that I don't that I don't have. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned leadership a little bit. I, I went to a military college where leadership was was uh, you know a big part of our education, and you know, I, I remember one thing they told me about about uh, leaders is that if you're a leader, you should always um, tell people that everything is going to be okay, and it'd be good if you could believe that uh, yourself as well. And um, so. Let's talk a little bit about the 800-pound uh, dragon <laughs> in the room, and talk about China and the recyclables market. And uh, you know, but before you start, you know, are, you, are you comfortable telling everybody that everything's going to be okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, my my view of that is, uh, you know, telling everybody, telling somebody that, every, that everything's going to be okay is not necessarily truthful. I think I think being truthful about it, being transparent. I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of transparency. I'm not necessarily a fan of blind optimism and, and Right now, it's hard to be blindly optimistic about the recycling business because there are some challenges. As as uh, as you know, we we spent ninety percent of our conference call on Friday, uh, our earnings call, talking about recycling, which makes up ten percent of our of our business. But it's important to people. It's it's and so I understand why the conversation took place. Uh, here's what I would say about China. I do understand why China is pushing back a bit. Uh, if I were in China's shoes, I wouldn't want to to import. Uh, trash from the United States and Canada, and that's effectively what they were doing, was importing trash. I mean, if I think about our own facilities, which we, I think we do an excellent job, led by Brent Bell, of, of running our facilities, but still the contamination, the trash that comes in the front door has gone from 10 to 15 percent five years ago to 20 to 25 percent. Everybody in the room who's familiar with recycling can give you a horror story of something that's come into a recycle plant. And, and so I think while China has taken some aggressive steps, and I don't see any reason why they'll go backwards, right. uh, I do think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's going to have to be a light where we take control of the, of the model. And, and I think the model has to change uh, in order for this to, to be something that we stop talking about. Uh, you know, really, I'd prefer to talk about the solid waste business right. on my conference call, which was fantastic and makes up 90% of, of our revenue stream, as opposed to the recycling business, which has all of these peaks and valleys, ebbs and flows in it. Right. And I have to talk about them, whether it's up here, because then they give you no credit for it on, and say, well, yeah, but it was recycling that caused your earnings to be good. Yeah. And then when it's down here, uh, you know, we want to talk about it 90% of the time because it's, it's been a detractor for our earnings. Right. I'd like to change the model a bit over the next uh, you know, next few years, so that we're not having to talk about it constantly. It's just an ordinary part of our business. Yeah, I agree. We're getting lots and lots of calls at the trade association from press and from our members, and uh, um, you know, we'd like to like to talk about other things as well. Yeah, I think I think part of the problem is that there's this huge social pressure to recycle. I mean, it, you, you hear it every day. You hear it from your kids, particularly your kids, right? I mean, your kids say, "Dad, I mean, I want you know." Or, or mom, I want to recycle that. I mean, we've got to recycle that. And and unfortunately, while that's aspirationally good. Aspirational recycling is not necessarily the right thing, particularly through the current technology. I mean, we have a single stream plant that really does a great job of handling plastic bottles and, and aluminum cans and tin cans and cardboards and mixed papers. Does not do a great job of handling a lawnmower. 
right. or <laughs> or a baby stroller or you know and just because a baby stroller has some recycled materials on yeah. it doesn't mean that our equipment in our single stream can disaggregate that and turn it into recycled materials right. what it means is it's going to go all the way through an $80 per ton process and come out the back end as trash and go to a landfill mm -hmm. and i think that's a little bit of the irony of 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 you know recycling versus diversion, we talked about it uh, you know on our conference call, and that is that people have changed the word. It's not recycling, which was intended to be uh, something that's environmentally sensitive that that results in a reuse of the material. I, I have a plastic bottle. This thing gets recycled. Either it turns into another plastic bottle. It turns into carpet. It turns into some other material, but it saves natural resources. Uh, diversion is not about necessarily you know, saving natural resources. Right. It's just about the first step away from the curb can't be a landfill. If the first step away from the curb is, is anything other than a landfill, then it's diversion. It counts as diversion, and therefore I should feel good about myself. Yeah. I don't necessarily feel good about myself if I know that I put something in the, in the recycle bin that ultimately is going to go to a landfill anyway. All right. Right, and that you know gets us to uh, the point of education. You know, we at the association are trying. Anytime we talk to the media, um, or uh, we did a grassroots alert to help, uh, you know, uh, local municipal encourage municipalities and Congress even to be aware of the problem and help, you know, encourage the citizenry to uh, not add to the contamination in the recycling stream. You know, I think everybody, you know, thinks you throw it in the recycling, it goes to this magical place where it, where it's going to get exactly. recycled, and you know, and they could be you know their good intentions um, could could lead to you know worse outcomes by, by contaminating the stream as everybody knows um, you know what can we do um, I, I, uh, to uh, you know increase awareness and education that you know it's different in every municipality you know I since I came back to the industry I've been gone for 25 years and I came back and and uh, learn some new things about recycling that I, di I didn't know. And uh, you know, how, what can we do? What can the trade association do, or what can companies do to start educating people? I mean, I really believe that NWRA can help out on the on the education side, but not necessarily the education of the consumer, mm -hmm. but the education of the municipalities. So it goes back to that word diversion. I mean, municipalities, I think today are are you know, they're they're so focused on that first step away from the curb that I think they've lost sight of what the original intent of recycling was, which is to save natural resources. That is the original intent of recycling. And that's, what, that's what's best for the environment. It is not necessarily best for the environment if my diversion goes from 50% to 75% and 80% of that is, is ultimately trash. So I think NWRA can really help in in trying to move the conversation back to recycling right. and away from this new word, which is diversion. Right. We're certainly going to be doing that. We're, we're starting to make Hill visits in, in that regard, encouraging Congress to, to, to contact their, their local um, districts and states and really trying to start working on the edu education And, and I think there are some encouraging the, steps yeah. taking place. Darrell. I think uh, I think it was the, the state of Florida that recently passed some legislation that allows companies to actually charge uh, Penalties, if you yeah. will, for contamination. Yeah, yeah. And and look, that's a good first step. I think there's some there's some cities that do that as well. I think Seattle's a city that does that. Uh, back to Vancouver, I think Vancouver does that as well. So there are some cities that take some aggressive stance uh, or an aggressive stand against yeah. contamination. But boy, I, you know, it, it with thirty to forty percent contamination, which is what we see in some of our plants, that jeopardizes the entire recycling industry. Honestly. Right. Well, um, you know, and technology can obviously help with that. And, you know, the trade show floor just opened, and we appreciate you guys coming here instead of rushing to the, to the trade show. But, um, you know, there's some amazing technologies. I was here last year as part of the interview process and before I was even in the industry and just amazed by, um, you know, some of the very cool stuff on the, on the trade show floor. Um, you know, are there opportunities relative to technology in this crisis with China or just in general? I mean, what... What opportunities do we have for, with, with uh, helping this boost technology? Or what, what are some of your favorite new, uh, new things coming along? You know, I think, I think this is an industry that's, that's constantly innovating. And, and so certainly opportunities within the cab of the truck. Right. Uh, there's been a lot of change, and, and, and we've talked about safety and, and the cameras inside the truck. Yeah. In my mind, it may have, may have been the biggest safety development in the last you know, three decades. Mm -hmm. It's a coaching mechanism for us. Uh, it's not a gotcha mechanism. It's a coaching mechanism. Sometimes it actually exonerates drivers. When a, you know, how many times 
a decade ago did a driver come in and say, yeah, you know, uh, I was just driving along minding my own business and, and uh, you know, somebody switched lanes into me. Yeah. And, and inevitably you say, yeah, okay, sure, I, you know, maybe, maybe not. Now, you can, now that driver knows that he or she is, can be proven with that point. And, and, and we can watch a video and see that, that somebody was texting and drifted into to, you know, her lane. Right. And, and she, had, you know, she had no control. She was just driving her vehicle, her, her truck, and, and, and this, this person who was texting drifted in. And you can see that on this, on this uh, 180 degree view. So that has been a tremendous uh, added technology. I think there's a lot of technology that, that helps with, with the labor side. Uh, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, but, but the, it's hard to hire somebody to work on a uh, traditional rear loader anymore. I mean, you know, if you hire somebody and say, look, you, you've got to have a CDL, but by the way, uh, you have to get out and, and, uh, and throw 800 homes a day. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's a lot to ask, as opposed to you've got to, you've got to work a joystick. So yeah. the ASL has been a, uh, the advent of the ASL has, has helped, I think, from that standpoint. Yeah, and I, you know, as a, my original career was safety, and, you know, the, the successes I've had in safety have always been big wins. You know, you, you can throw everything, the kitchen sink, to, at safety, which is good. You know, educate, you know, just throw everything at everybody. But when you really make a big win in safety, and it's usually some sort of new technology or engineering control where you're just really, you know, taking the hazard out of the equation. And I, you know, coming into the industry, you know, you know, not trying to step on anybody's toes or anything, but the, the thing that sounded to me immediately like a big win would be, you know, the automatic um, um, trucks and, you know, because autonomous vehicles. Yeah, autonomous vehicles, you know, yeah. keeping people out of the street where they're getting, where they're getting hit by cars. So, you know, I, look, uh, it doesn't work everywhere. Trevath and I have a, have a bet on this, which he's probably going to win, but uh, it's, it's, <laughs> You know, the, 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 I, I said I think we'll have an autonomous vehicle on a route, not making up the majority of our routes, but on a route within a decade. Yeah. He said, I, we'll bet, uh, I don't know what we bet. It was, it was a small bet, Jim, I think. Um, but uh, maybe a cup of coffee. But, um, <laughs> but look, I do think that at some point, here, here's, the, here's the issue with autonomous vehicles. Yeah. It's not the technology. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not the technology any more than, than it's the technology for an A380 airplane. I mean, an A380 can, can taxi take off, fly its route, land and taxi back to the gate autonomously. Right. But if you get on an A380 and you look up to the left and there's nobody sitting there, you're, you're off, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I, and, and that's the wrong decision because right. what is, what's the, I don't know what the stats are, 90% of all aircraft accidents are caused by you know, the people sitting up front. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they do a great job, by the way. I think yeah. you know last week was the first fatality. And speaking of safety in, in right. that industry, and uh, in it's the been a while, it's been in a while, 2009. Yeah. But but I think it's public perception and government uh, and government uh, regulation that ultimately will be the the laggards. It's not the technology. Uh, I, I rode around in autonomous. A couple of us rode around last year in Mountain View, California, in an autonomous car, and it was amazing. I mean, there was an engineer sitting up front just in case the thing went haywire, but. Um, but we rode around Mountain View, California. We drove on 101. If you're not familiar with 101, it's a busy, busy freeway mm -hmm. in, outside of San Francisco. Uh, this thing stopped for the stoplight as you entered the freeway. It, it, it navigated lane changes. It got off. It stopped for pedestrians in Mountain View. It was, it was amazing. That's cool. And the only time the engineer had to take control of it was when we had to break a law. We, on a city <laughs> street, we had to go around a, a, a utility vehicle, yeah. public utility vehicle. And it wouldn't cross the double yellow. Yeah. So we would, we'd still be sitting there. If, if yeah. uh, <laughs> so it actually, uh, you know, the guy disengaged the, uh, the autonomous mode and we moved around it. But the technology is amazing and it's mm -hmm. made tremendous strides. But public perception, do, if we come to you and say, look, we've, we're changing our residential routes to autonomous vehicles, do you really want, at this point, it's going to be hard to convince the neighborhood that we're going to have a, a driverless truck prowling around the neighborhood. Yeah. And I think eventually, Perception will, will catch up with technology. I think eventually government regulation will catch up with technology. That's why I believe in a decade it's possible that we'll have a, uh, at least a, a test route running on an autonomous vehicle. I think off the road, on our landfills and in our recycle facilities, yeah. I think that'll happen in the next possibly in the next year. Yeah, we have a lot of autonomous stuff starting up in the mining, in the mining industry, industry yeah. too. So I've got a couple more questions, but I am going to let you guys know now that I am going to open up the audience to, so you guys can uh, ask a couple questions of Jim. So if you want to uh, 
start thinking now. That would that would be good. Um, and uh, my one one more question, you know, other than China, you know, what what are the what are the biggest challenges right now in the industry? What what uh, keeps you up at night, as they say? So, you know, I, I mean, I get asked that question a lot. I would tell you that's. What keeps me up at night, it's not, uh, there are two different answers, by the way. What keeps me up at night is not the challenges in the industry. Um, and it's a bit surprising to me when I took the job 18 months ago. What keeps me up at night is that we have 43,000 teammates that rely on me. I mean, there's nobody else I can point to. When I was CFO, I could always point to Steiner and say, I, I, it was his goal. <laughs> right. I mean, it wouldn't be. The buck starts I mean, here, right? <laughs> there's no more Steiner there. I, yeah. You know, it's now it's me and 43,000 people who look to make a career out of their, their positions at Waste yeah. Management. And ultimately, while the senior leadership team and leadership team at Waste Management are making strategic decisions, ultimately, I'm the, I, it kind of the buck stops here. And right. so what keeps me up at night is, is wanting to make sure that I make the right decisions for 43,000 people. That's, that's what's, and that's something I didn't really anticipate coming yeah. into the job. Yeah. The second answer is about you know, the challenges of the industry. And, and look, I. One thing about the industry is that we have a fantastic business model, and I didn't fully appreciate that until I spent some time in the industry. Um, it, it's, it is what really has caused this industry. It's, it's, uh, you notice that there's a lot of private equity investment in the industry. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why private, private equity is not stupid. The reason there's a lot of private equity investment in the industry is because it's a great business. It's a great business model. It's not a model that has, with the exception of that, that minority, which is, is recycling that does have some some volatility right. to it. The rest of the business model is is a is a nice continuous growth business model, and certainly we have some challenges. We have some challenges with safety. Mm -hmm. We have some challenges with with uh, on the on the employment side. Um, we're starting to tackle those uh, strongly. I would I would argue that safety is something we've been tackling for a long time. Mm -hmm. We're not consistent. To, we're not as consistent as we could be. But safety is something that that uh, I think we've, we've all recognized is something we need to tackle. Uh, but, but technology, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've recently uh, put a senior vice president of digital technology in our uh, Nikolai Shokvist, and he, he is starting to really tackle technology as a differentiator for us. I would expect that this industry will, will continue to grow from a technology standpoint. Yeah, yeah. and look into your crystal ball. What, what, what's the industry going to be like in 50 years? Well, so one of the things in 50 years that will be a challenge for us is, is the, the disposal network. Mm -hmm. When I look at our landfill network, which is a very valuable, the landfill network is, is, is hugely, hugely valuable to waste management. If, I were, if you were to ask me what asset is the most important asset besides our people, I would tell you it's the landfill network. Mm -hmm. And yet, those landfills have a natural end of their lives. I mean, you know, I, I pick a landfill around a major city in the waste management network, and all of them probably have a natural end of their lives within the next 30 years. Now, we have some landfills that have 150 years of life, but right. most of those are not in or around big metro areas. And so replacing that, whether it's replaced with another landfill, mm -hmm. which, which probably isn't the case, it can't be the case, because you've got, you know, our Atascaceta landfill in Houston, when it was opened, it sat out in the middle of a, of a cotton field. And now, uh, you know, Jim's house is literally, Jim Trevathan's house is three miles away. There's neighborhoods that are built around these landfills. There's no more room to expand out. So what happens in 28 years or whenever it is that that landfill comes to the end of its life? Do we just kind of use a concentric circle model and go farther out and, and just transport out to it? Or do we replace it with some type of technology? And I, and I think within 50 years, now maybe not within 10 years, but within 50 years uh, and, and maybe, uh, you know, less than that, maybe within 20 years, um, there will be a, a replacement technology that helps us with this problem mm -hmm. of these landfills going away. Uh, you, you know, you're not going to take all of these big cities' waste and transport them a thousand miles to right. some field out in the middle of nowhere. Right, right. Well, we'll open the, the floor for questions, I believe. And I, you know, I don't see anybody uh, with microphones, but if you just want to, it's a small room. If you want to raise your hand like this guy back here, we'll uh, open it up. Your 
So the, everybody heard the question on franchising, I think. I, I mean, yes, we have 10 months of experience. I would tell you that the Los Angeles franchise has been a little bumpy. That rollout has, has been bumpy for all of the, the, the franchisees. Um, and, you know, th there's, there's plenty of uh, finger pointing uh, going on there. But, but I would tell you that I think Los Angeles will be uh, running smoothly uh, within the, probably within the next six months. Uh, it's just taken some time. There was more volume than we thought, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but but uh, maybe didn't anticipate it going in. Um, I, franchises have been around for a long time. We've been a, a, a franchisee for, for many cities for a long time, but um, I, I'm not sure I have a preference uh, for a franchise mar market versus an open market. There's pros and cons to each. I know that from the city's perspective, that the franch franchises provide uh, you know, a fee for them. I think that's probably the, was the primary um, consideration as, as Los Angeles chose to, to franchise. But from the, from the hauler standpoint, I'm not sure I have a bias either way. I, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're servicing a customer, and that's, that's the way we look at it. Yes, sir. There's a, there's a microphone rapidly walking up the hallway here. <laughs> Talk as fast as I, I apologize. <laughs> New York and New Jersey both um, have, uh, um, if you text while you drive, you get, um, you, you, you get a violation, and it's more uh, points than monetary, which, you, which leads to a suspended license. So. Um, but the question that I have is, does waste management have a uh, uh, research and development um, division speaking about autonomous uh, 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 trucks and um, landfill uh, solutions, um, which uh, you've uh, mentioned? Um, so to reiterate, my question is, does waste management have an R&D division? And if yes, can you expound a bit on it? So, so the question, uh, you know, and I think everybody heard with the microphone, but we do have a group that's called our Organic Growth Group. Waste management spent over $500 million in the last seven or eight years looking for a next generation of landfills. But that Organic Growth Group is not just looking at disposal technologies. They're, they're looking at, they're the, the ones that set up this, this ride along uh, in, in Northern California with the autonomous vehicles. They, they, those are the types of things they're looking at. I would tell you this, we've changed the way we approach uh, you know, R&D. We don't, um, or, or it's almost more of a venture capital uh, uh, group as opposed to an R&D group. But we've changed the way we do that. We used to, in, in the early years, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago, we'd just go out and bought a piece of a company. And, and we'd, got, we'd find a guy in the back of his garage in, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, who's had a machine that could create a barrel of oil out of a washing machine, and, and, we'd, and we bought a piece of it. And then we later found out that, you know what, actually it didn't work. He just had, a, he had, a, you know, he had an oil can that he kept filling up in the back. So, <laughs> um, we, so we didn't really do our due diligence there. But uh, we've changed that a bit. And, and, and in all seriousness, part of the problem was that we just didn't have enough people to go around to do all of the due diligence in this $500 million worth of investments. And there were a lot of different companies. A lot of these companies had, had kind of great prospects, but they couldn't. What I've always said about those is you have to be able to clear three hurdles. First, it has to work to the guy in Cheyenne, Wyoming. No, no disrespect to Cheyenne, Wyoming, but uh, my mom's from Wyoming. So, um, second, it has to be scalable. Um, and a lot of these technologies work in a laboratory setting, but, but thinking about them on a thousand ton a day setting is much different. Turning cardboard into cellulosic ethanol in a beaker is one thing. <laughs> Turning it into cellulosic ethanol when I'm taking a thousand tons a day into a to a big recycle plant, and it's it's contaminated. It's got you know it's it's wet. That's a different animal. So it's got to be scalable. And then third is the economics of it. And landfills are very very economically efficient. And and so. Uh, it's one thing to, to go to a, a big customer, to, to walk into a Walmart. I, I, I met with, with uh, their CEO a couple of weeks ago, and, I, and he was asking this exact question. And I said, look, waste management could probably get you to zero waste in the next three months. That's the good news. Zero landfill. The bad news is we're going to come to you and tell you it's going to be at five times your cost. And, and that's the problem is none of those... $500 million worth of technologies have been able to clear that third hurdle. 
which is competing with a very efficient way of disposing of waste, which is landfills. May not be the most popular way of disposing of waste, but it's a very efficient, very environmentally friendly. If you've ever been to a developing country, if you've ever been to India, and you see how India disposes of waste in what they call the, a landfill, they don't call it a landfill, it's still called, a, I don't know what the, what the word is for it over there, but, they, but in my mind, it's, it's a dump. And there's, there's no structural integrity to it. There is, there's very little kind of uh, monitoring of it. There's no lining to it. We have, these are engineered facilities today, but they're engineered at a relatively low cost compared to these other technologies. At some point, and it may be in the next 50 years, Daryl, mm -hmm. but at some point, a technology comes up along that can cross all three hurdles, that can clear all three hurdles. And then at that point, uh, that's when our OGG team, who by the way is looking for that, hopes to, to have our foot in the door. Sounds like a challenge for some folks out there. So. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Jim and Daryl. I'm Alina Hudak. I'm the director of Miami-Dade Solid Waste. And then first of all, I want to thank you for your team in Miami. They are an extension of us, and they're a very good partner. We appreciate that very much. I was curious if you could comment about CNG. Um, we've been trying to do a procurement for about five years and do a conversion to CNG. It has not been successful in terms of delivering a product that we feel comfortable with. I'm just curious, your fleet throughout the country, what the mix is, and what your experience has been with this fleet. Is that your pink trunk out front? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so uh, we're approaching 50% of our routed vehicles are natural gas vehicles, and it will exceed 50% of our routed uh, vehicles will be natural gas. Uh, about, I, I would, I'm guessing here, but I think close to 90% of the trucks that we'll buy this year and we'll buy somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,800 trucks this year will be natural gas trucks. The 10% or so that are not, are that's a, ch that's a challenge for us that, that we're, we're tackling, but it's in, in kind of small rural areas where the economies of scale don't work. I mean, uh, you, you know, um, and more importantly, where you don't have uh, access to refueling. So um, we think we'll be able to solve that problem over the long haul, but right now we still have some big facilities that are not, some in South Florida, by the way, that are not natural gas. And the intent is for us to move all of those facilities to natural gas. So you'll see that number of, of kind of percent of routed vehicles climb above 50% this year. And then as we go forward, it'll continue to climb. And in the meantime, we're looking to find a solution for those small rural facilities. I have no idea when I'm supposed to stop talking to you. But, uh, we, we, we think we <laughs> got it. Somebody told me about Yes, sir. I'm being biased, toward, I'm being the biased towards the front row. Does that mean, does that mean <laughs> you have a question, or does that mean we're, we're done? done? <laughs> That's okay. what it means. Yeah. One, time for a quick question. Okay, one more question. One more. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I was in the business uh, for 17 years in the heyday of the 90s when Waste was acquiring companies at every day, and, and culture, the focus on culture back then, was basically non-existent. We worked for you know tough guys who just you know it was all about profit or productivity. Uh, I left, started a software business, uh, and then learned about really what it means to attract talent in a in a knowledge economy industry. Uh, and now I've got a hauling company in a small landfill and trying to keep my daughter in the business, a university grad. What what advice would you give? And I'm sorry to put her on the spot, but what advice would you give a, a 24 year old? <laughs> you know, millennial who uh, who wants to stick in this business, what advice would you give to her that would be different than I might have gotten back in those days? So I would tell you, first of all, no disrespect to to your dad who worked in the software space, but but in the in this industry, uh, you, you you don't have there's there's not the bright shiny object necessarily, but it goes back to what I said earlier. This is a fantastic business model. It has a nice growth trajectory. It's a safe industry. It's a great industry to to, um, to make a career. Uh, look, the, the tech industry is a fantastic industry, but it does have, uh, it feels like some of those companies have a much more limited life than does waste management or, or any other business in this industry. So we're thrilled to have you in the industry. Glad your dad uh, you know, uh, was able to persuade you to join us. Yeah. Well, Jim, 